Here on Nature League, we explore the amazingness of life on Earth. For me, the most humbling topic in all of biology is that of extinction, and thinking about the way that species come and go over Earth's history. We've created several videos exploring the theme of extinction, and our first was all about Earth's past and present extinction events. So let's start with some definitions. If we want to talk about extinction, we should have a working definition to go off of. In biology, we typically talk about extinction as the cessation of existence of a species or group of taxa reducing biodiversity. Cessation just means no longer having or the lack of, so lack of existence. And this can be of a species or an entire group of species. And what happens when you have extinction events is that biodiversity goes down. So what's the actual moment of extinction? Well, we can generally consider this to be the death of the last individual of that species. However, the capacity to breed and recover may have been lost before this point that we're calling the moment of extinction. And in this case, we refer to these species as functionally extinct. Basically, imagine you have two individuals left, but for whatever reason, they aren't able to breed. That species will go extinct, even though there are two individuals left. Not everything is created equal in terms of the chance of extinction or the probability. For example, we see different different problems with populations, particularly ones that are sparse to begin with. When you have really sparse populations, females may have a smaller chance of meeting a male, and so there is less of a chance for reproduction to occur. Also, if you have small populations, they can sometimes experience increased death rates, usually due to greater predation. This is also a major problem. And with small or sparse populations, they actually might not be large enough to stimulate social behavior necessary for successful reproduction. Activity. Some species have certain behaviors that are cued in in social situations, and they need a certain amount of individuals for these behaviors to happen. Another concept to consider within the realm of extinction is the idea of a population or genetic bottleneck. This is when you have a significant percentage of a population killed or prevented from reproducing. Some other definitions are when a population is reduced by 50% or more. With genetic bottlenecks, you can have increases in inbreeding, and this is due to having a reduced pool of possible mates. If there are traits that wind up being harmful to an individual and then the species or the population, this winds up being an issue and can lead to increased chance of extinction. So who is actually most vulnerable to something like extinction? There's some traits that we've seen over time that wind up being correlated with a higher chance of an extinction event. One of these is if the population or species is naturally rare. So just in general, there aren't that many of them. Also, how big the range size matters. If they aren't a species that winds up having a really big range in places to go, we do see higher rates of extinction. Also, reproduction matters. So if you have a species with low fecundity, that's the actual reproductive rate, that's an issue as well. Another trait of species that might be more vulnerable to extinction are ones that are dependent on unpredictable resources. So if you have a species that has some kind of a food or maybe some kind of a habitat preference that's really variable, this can be a problem and lead to a higher vulnerability. And of course, as the human population continues to grow, species that are more vulnerable to human persecution are also at a higher chance of extinction. Other general traits that we see that increase extinction probability are things like larger body size, small or restricted geographic range, habitat or food specialization, lack of genetic diversity, and loss of alternate prey species. Extinction isn't just something that happens because of human pressures. There's also an extinction rate that's normal in the fossil record, and this is known as the background extinction rate. Throughout the fossil record, we define extinction events as relatively short periods with greatly increased extinction rates. You may have heard the phrase mass extinction. A mass extinction event must eliminate more than 60% of species in a relatively short period of geological time with widespread impacts. Mass extinction events are important and matter because of the disruptive effect they have on the way that biodiversity develops. So we've talked about two different kinds of extinction. First, natural or background extinction, which is when each year you lose a small number of species and they become extinct naturally. We've also talked about a mass extinction. And these are periods when the Earth's biodiversity is drastically reduced when large numbers of species become extinct. In general, scientists agree that there have been five mass extinctions in the Earth's history. If you're not familiar with Earth's mass extinctions, here's a little bit of a highlight reel. We had one in the late Permian, and this is when 90% of shallow water marine invertebrates disappeared. You might have also heard of the Cretaceous extinction event. Why? 
because that's when the dinosaurs vanished. And dinosaurs are awesome, so we definitely talk about this extinction event a lot, even though other ones have actually had a higher loss of biodiversity. And the most recent one is the one in the Pleistocene. And that's when we saw large mammals die off, and this was only a matter of tens of thousands of years ago. These are all mass extinction events of the past. But what about extinction happening today? Well, the leading cause of extinction, at least right now, and based on the data we have available, is habitat loss or destruction. Basically, species don't have enough evolutionary time to adapt to how fast these changes are taking place. To think about current extinction rates, we have to compare them to something. And typically, we compare them to the background extinction rate. Most scientists believe that current extinction rates are at 100 to 1,000 times higher than background Rates. Assuming an extinction rate of 0.1%, which is more on the conservative side, we're actually losing 5,000 species a year if we assume that there are 5 million species. Now, of course, there's a lot of assumptions here, but these are just kind of our best estimates at present. Other estimates say that we might lose 25% of current animal and plant species by the year 2050, and even some estimates say 50% by the year 2100. One thing we're pretty sure about is that extinction rates right now are increasing. And and the growth of the human population will increase this loss. Interestingly, extinction rates are actually higher where there are more endangered species. And habitat also matters when it comes to extinction and biodiversity. For example, tropical forests, coral reefs, wetlands, and estuaries, which are sites of new species and speciation events, are currently being destroyed. So, are we currently in the Earth's sixth mass extinction? Yes, and maybe no. The thing is, it's really complicated but we can look at certain things that are unique about the current loss of species. One of the things that's unique is the time scale. And another thing that's unique is the root cause, that being a conscious living species that knows what it's doing and can think about the consequences. Here's what I mean by this. In Earth's history, there have been extinction events where a single species has caused a lot of problems. So I'm thinking about cyanobacteria and how they changed Earth's atmosphere, pumping out oxygen and basically killing things with oxygen toxicity. Now, even though that happened, and that was an extinction event due to maybe one or a few species, to our knowledge, those cyanobacteria didn't know what they were doing. They weren't aware of it. They weren't having meetings to discuss what to do. It just happened. Again, to the best of our knowledge, but that's what we have to go on. I bring up consciousness and knowledge of actions because I really think that's the difference between some of these past events and what we have right now. Humans have knowledge that species are being lost. And because of that, we have an actual responsibility to consider the cause and effects as we move forward. So why does extinction matter? What happens if species become extinct? Well, we lose a lot of things that species are. And we can kind of start by going through these like the values in biodiversity. There's instrumental value, things that are actually useful and provide us services directly, like having food, lumber, or even pharmaceuticals. And one of my favorite values related to biodiversity are actually non-use values. So there's existence value of biodiversity, knowing it's there, even if we never see them individually or in person, still gives us some kind of hope or happiness. Same with aesthetic value, appreciating it for its beauty, which would be lost when species go extinct. Also something like bequest value, knowing that if a species goes extinct, the future generations or our family won't get to know that species themselves. And losing species also means losing what they do in their ecosystems. Each species is a component of an entire ecosystem, and that has functions like energy flow and nutrient recycling and population control. Everything is connected, and so losing pieces absolutely affects the entire system. If we just look at it from a human-centric perspective, altogether preventing extinction helps us sustain our own health and well-being. But if we take humans out of it, there's also something to be said for the intrinsic value of species existing for their own sake. So what does the future look like? Right now, there's insufficient knowledge of the natural world to predict how much extinction ecosystems can experience without losing major function. If the present extinction event continues unchecked, we could push ecosystems beyond the threshold at which they sustain the well-being of the species within them. Overall, biodiversity has recovered following each mass extinction throughout Earth's history, but only after the cause of the event had gone away.
One of the most talked about extinction events is when the non-avian dinosaurs disappeared from Earth. Here in Montana, there's a rock layer exposed that contains a piece of this history. So we went on a field trip to Makoshika State Park to see where the dinosaurs went extinct. When you mention mass extinction, most people think of the time when dinosaurs vanished from Earth. This seems to be the mass extinction event we can all easily think of, most likely because dinosaurs are super awesome and the whole story is totally epic. It's one thing to talk about a mass extinction, but another thing entirely to see where one took place. For this month's field trip, I'd like to share some footage from a special trip I took last summer to the KPG boundary, the layer of Earth from the time of the dinosaurs' mass extinction. This past summer, I got to help out with a paleontology course being taught in Makoshika State Park with two good buddies, Dan and Chris. Makoshika is in the badlands of eastern Montana. It's where one of the opening scenes of Jurassic Park the movie is supposed to have taken place, but I'm pretty sure they shot it at like somewhere near California. Anyways, for starters, the Badlands are completely stunning, and that's even before you start taking the dinosaurs into consideration. The exposed rocks show millions of years of geological time, and during the sunset on our first night at base camp, Dan and Chris explained the geological formations visible from base camp. I, meanwhile, got footage of this incredible landscape. The summer nights in eastern Montana can be filled with thunderstorms that stretch as far as the eye can see. We happened to catch a really great lightning storm one night, and while I probably should have stayed indoors, I I couldn't help but grab some footage of the skies. I wonder what the skies looked like for the dinosaurs that used to live here, and if they enjoyed these skies as much as I do. We saved a surprise for the students until later in the week. We told them we were hiking down to a location where we'd investigate rock layers. What they didn't know is that we were taking them to one of the few places on Earth where you can see and touch the layers that form the KPG boundary. Chris was excited to show the students the layers, but was not impressed by my cinematography pursuits. As we got to the end of the trail, we had the students examine the layers of rock and take notes of anything that stood out. I, meanwhile, went into turbo mode and climbed all over the rocks. When in Makoshika. I also just really like climbing things. So a little bit more about this location. The KPG boundary is a geological signature marking the end of the Cretaceous period and the beginning of the Paleogene period. It used to be called the KT boundary, an abbreviation for Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, but geologists have since messed with the naming to reflect different divisions of geological time. The end of the Cretaceous period is of note because it includes and is sometimes defined by the a mass extinction that occurred approximately 66 million years ago. While geologists are pretty certain about the transition from the Cretaceous to the Paleogene, it's a different thing entirely to see it in person. Makoshika State Park in eastern Montana is one of only a few places in North America where the KPG boundary is exposed and actually accessible. While there are many places around the world where the boundary is apparent, this spot is up there in terms of total experience and ease of access. We revealed to the students that the layers we were looking at contained the KPG boundary. Surprise! After investigating the differences in sediment, color, texture, etc., we sat down to discuss the extinction event in general. The time that separates T. rex from Stegosaurus is even greater. So Stegosaurus was already a fossil when T. rex was alive. Basically, all of the uh, periods of time in the Mesozoic, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and with a, 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 an extinction event. Scientific consensus has changed over time, but at present, the most likely mechanism for the mass extinction event was an asteroid colliding with the Earth near the current day Yucatan Peninsula. This collision disrupted climate and ecosystems globally and led to the extinction of almost three fourths of life on Earth at the time, including our favorite non-avian dinosaurs. And yet, in the millions of years that followed, new life forms appeared on Earth and groups like mammals, birds, fish, and some reptiles radiated and diverged diversified, leading to the incredible biodiversity we see at present. And now, a word. Not from our sponsors, but from the dictionary. Welcome to this month's Wild Word. Once a month on Nature League, we'll look at the etymology, or origin and history, of words related to nature. This month's theme is extinction, and we've discussed extinctions throughout Earth's history and a potential sixth mass extinction happening right now. And the right now has a name particularly in terms of geological eras. This month's wild word is Anthropocene. The word Anthropocene can actually be traced back to Greek, but it has two separate parts we should look at. The first part, anthropo, comes from the Greek word anthropos, which translates to man or human being. The second part of the word, scene, comes from the Greek word kainos, meaning new or recent. After the Cretaceous period and the extinction of the dinosaurs, geological epochs had the ending scene tacked on. For example, the Oligocene, Miocene, and Pleistocene. These epochs make up Earth's 
Earth's recent history, but geologists are considering naming the time period we're currently in after mankind. Some have argued that by naming the current epoch after ourselves, we're claiming some kind of ownership over the Earth and its systems, and that it sounds like we're just saying that we rule. While human dominance is inarguable when you look at the sheer impact our species has had on Earth, I like to think of the Anthropocene as being named for people not because we're in charge, but rather because we're responsible for the drastic changes occurring on the planet. So while a formal definition of Anthropocene is relating to or denoting the current geological age viewed as the period during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment, Anthropocene comes from two Greek words that literally mean new human. And instead of an ego boost, I like to think of this as a lovely reminder to consider the effects of our current choices. It's weird to say that one of my favorite places on Earth is this small layer of dirt in eastern Montana that harbors a beyond depressing event, but I can't help but love this place. Our day-to-day -day lives move so quickly, and it's hard to think about what I'm doing next week, much less in the timescale of millions of years. Yet when I'm here touching these pieces, I'm shaken with an overwhelming sense of humility. This layer tells the story of loss of life on a scale unimaginable, and yet, Without the loss of the species living at the end of the Cretaceous, Earth as we know it would be unrecognizable. Humans may not have ever come to exist. When I touch this layer, I'm reminded that this lethal event led in part to my own living existence. Extinction is never an easy thing to think about, and we're facing major challenges when it comes to conserving the species threatened with extinction today. By looking at a longer time scale, however, I'm hopeful that, well, life, uh, finds a way. I truly love this place, and I hope that you too were able to enjoy it. The good and the bad, the mass extinction, and the recovery of life on Earth. While the extinction of the dinosaurs is a fascinating and iconic topic, there are species on Earth going extinct right now in the present. Some of the world's species most threatened by extinction are insects, and in a format called Denatured, I broke down a recent scientific journal article about the endangered state of this incredible group of species. For this month's Denatured segment, we're going to look at an article released online in January 2019 in the journal Biological Conservation. This month is all about extinction, and in this month's lesson plan, we discuss some traits that are connected to a higher likelihood of extinction. We mentioned how species with larger body sizes and ranges are typically more likely to go extinct from currently existing threats and pressures. But what about smaller organisms? What about the world's insects? Are they actually going extinct? In this paper entitled Worldwide Decline of the Entomophana, a review of its drivers, the researchers investigated current trends and types of extinction threats to entomofauna, or insects, worldwide, and their results have stirred up some serious alarm. But first, let's discuss what's already known. It's estimated that about one-fifth of all vertebrates on Earth are threatened with extinction. These estimates come from decades of research on vertebrate species around the world. However, scientists have only recently started noting concerns about extinction risks to invertebrates, including insects. The main drivers of biodiversity loss at present are habitat loss and overexploitation. However, there's also evidence that the intensification of agriculture is the main driver of declines in smaller groups of taxa, like birds, insect-eating mammals, and insects. And it's not just the conversion of some habitat into agricultural lands, it's also the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides that's driving some of the declines. In fact, two studies in 2013 pointed to pesticides as the primary driver of population declines of grassland birds and stream organisms. However, we don't know whether these factors are also connected to the global decline of insects being witnessed at present. Unfortunately, more and more research is providing evidence for a major and ongoing decline in insects worldwide. What's additionally troubling is that even though insects make up close to two-thirds of all land-dwelling species on Earth, most of the recent studies on insect declines weren't able to explain the majority of the declines. In this study, the team summarized all available research on insect declines worldwide and identified likely causes of these declines. They searched databases of peer-reviewed literature for any long-term insect surveys published within the last 40 years. They came up with 653 total publications, but filtered this list by removing studies that focused on individual species, outbreaks of pest species, and species considered invasive. Additional filtering related to study design and data types was implemented, resulting in a final total of 73 papers. The team used these papers to estimate the annual rate of decline for different groups of insects and regions of the world. Then, they counted and analyzed the reported drivers 
drivers of these declines. So what they find? In this paper, the authors report their findings by taxa, or species groups, and by region. These details are available in the full article, but for the purposes of this episode, we're going to focus on overall trends and threats. Overall, the largest losses of insect biodiversity on land are in dung beetles in Mediterranean countries. Of these species, more than 60% are in decline, and a large proportion are considered threatened with extinction. Almost half of moth and butterfly species are declining more quickly than expected, and in bees, one in six species have gone regionally extinct. Overall, aquatic insects fared even worse than those on land. The research team also wanted to investigate what the drivers of these declines were, as stated in the papers they considered. Close to half of the studies included in their meta-analysis indicated that habitat loss and change were the main driver of insect declines, and the authors stressed that a lot of this is due to agriculture. In fact, a quarter of their studies indicated that agriculture-related practices were the main driver of insect declines, both on land and in aquatic systems. The second main driver of reported insect declines was pollution, specifically in the form of fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, sewage and landfill components, and industrial chemicals from factories and mining operations. Other drivers included biological factors like parasites and pathogens, and climate change, which impacts abundance and distribution of many insect species. In conclusion, by compiling the results of published peer-reviewed articles, the authors estimate that the proportion of insect species in decline is 41 percent, and the pace of local extinctions is 10 percent. In the countries studied, the researchers estimate that about one-third of all insect species are threatened with extinction. This article is making major waves on social media and in the mainstream news media, which is rare for a journal article. Here's why I think the peer-reviewed piece is making the rounds. First off, we're sort of late to the insect game research-wise, despite them making up such a massive amount of life on Earth. So anytime a review article is published that catches us up on such a big piece of biodiversity, scientists and the public alike get excited. So that's the positive spin here, but you can probably guess what's coming next. The main reason I think this study went viral is because the news is bad. Like, really bad. To put it in perspective, the 41% of insects declining is double the proportion of decline in vertebrate species. And the local extinction rate of insects, this study estimates, is eight times the local extinction rate of vertebrates. So perhaps a better question is, what's the big deal about losing insects? Most scientists will cite quite a few reasons, and most of these have to do with the services that insects provide for us and other species. These include pollination, food, nutrient cycling, and decomposition, among many others. What's more, the authors mentioned that because the declines in insects were documented in the majority of species across different groups of taxa, it is, in the author's words, evident that we are witnessing the largest extinction event on Earth since the late Permian and Cretaceous periods. Cool. As with any piece of new research, there are several areas of improvement that exist in this study. This study was a meta-analysis. That means the researchers compiled and analyzed other research. So this study is subject to all of the uncertainties of the 73 papers included in their analysis. My issue is not with meta-analyses, but rather with data uncertainty. There's simply not enough information provided in the paper as presented to analyze the sources or extent of uncertainty in combining this many different measurements from so many different papers. Another issue I have with this meta-analysis is the inherent geographic bias in data availability. Long-term scientific surveys typically get funded and take place in developed countries, usually in the Northern Hemisphere. However, the authors directly acknowledge this and suggest that their review doesn't, in their words, adequately cover trends in tropical regions where information on insect biodiversity is either incomplete or lacking. And now for some real talk. One of my critiques here is more of a word of caution, particularly when discussing the results. There is a big difference between declining populations and extinct populations. Just because a population or species is declining does not mean it is or will go extinct. We have to be really careful to distinguish these two processes. The authors of this paper do a good job of making this distinction, but some reporting outlets have definitely confused the two. So let's be clear. This study used other studies to estimate that 41% of insect species species are currently in decline. But these species are still here, and still living, mutating, adapting, and evolving to the threats they're facing. While extinctions have and will continue to happen, life on Earth has proven itself to be a formidable contender. My last critique comes from ongoing research in both ecology and environmental philosophy, and it has to do with phrases and wording about ecosystems being pushed beyond the brink and collapsing. For example, in the conclusion section of the paper, the authors state that in terms of these current insect declines, 
The repercussions this will have for the planet's ecosystems are catastrophic, to say the least, as insects are at the structural and functional base of many of the world's ecosystems. Okay, so these are strong words, and the news outlets reporting on this study are using the same kind of collapse and catastrophe language. Don't get me wrong, if this report is accurate, I'm not happy about the results. I personally value having more species on Earth than less, but that value comes from a place of intrinsic worth, and not some balance of nature, ecosystem stability angle. The thing is, we don't really know what happens to ecosystems without insects. Perhaps this would result in other species going extinct, or perhaps other species would fill these functional roles and a different form of biodiversity would exist. There isn't some perfectly balanced ecosystem. This is completely relative to a pre-established idea of what balanced looks like. So my biggest critique here is a personal one. I wish we could discuss how much it sucks to lose species because of their own intrinsic worth instead of some human-conceived notion of the balance of nature. My personal take-home message? Insects are incredible in their own right, and our actions are negatively impacting them in ways that could lead to some extinctions. We couldn't complete the theme of extinction without letting my friend Adrian ask me a question about the topic. In this installment of From A to B, Adrian asked me to guess which species on Earth right now could become a dominant force after humans go extinct in the future. So when humans inevitably all just die off, what species that is currently on the planet do you think will take the human's place as the dominant life form on land? Why are humans dominant? For you, like, what's your definition? Because we can manipulate the land okay. more efficiently and basically do literally anything we want to the land. We have built cities. We have multiplied more exponentially than any other animal in know. history. The human population on this planet has doubled since 1970. When Thanos snaps his fingers, we go back to the 70s. Who That's that? Thanos? <laughs> I don't know. You don't know who Thanos is? Sounds Greek. <sighs> this is our friendship. <laughs> I'm just saying, think of it like this. If somebody snapped his finger, if he had, say, an infinity gauntlet, mm -hmm. and he snapped his finger, and half of all humans on the planet were to just turn into dust, mm -hmm. one of them would go, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so good. That we one's Iron Man. <laughs> then that would just take us back to the 70s. There is no other creature on this planet that has done that, whose population has done that. It, I, I mean... Bacteria do it way faster and all the time. I'm saying you can't but, use but, exponential growth as but, a qualifier. But, but not just that. It's like humans, if they wanted to, mm -hmm. could kill off mm -hmm. every other animal on the planet and um, have next to no problem doing so. We are the apex predator. Okay. Period. Okay. Apex predator versus dominant species versus reproductive capacity versus building cities. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a lot of ways we can define dominance. So building but cities But I would say is... that all of those factor into one thing. It is this large umbrella that humans can do all of these things. Do you think that there is a species currently on this planet that could take our place and do all of these things? I mean, ants? Plants, plant biomass, terrestrial plant biomass, just like how much there is, you know, by, by like weight. There's way more than terrestrial animals and they completely affect the climate. They're basically doing the regulation of both like carbon dioxide and oxygen. If you think back to the like creation of the atmosphere, that was things like cyanobacteria. I mean, they radically shaped the entire atmosphere. Yeah, but they weren't they weren't like planning it out. They weren't like, you know what we're going to do to the atmosphere. We're going to kill everything with oxygen. I don't, I don't know oxygen. what they did. I don't know what they did. They killed everything with oxygen. They killed everything with oxygen? Well, they created it and then everything, but it was like, haven't done this yet. So shaping, truly manipulating, shaping the earth. I think there's an argument to be made that a species that can radically change the atmosphere is a prob probably a pretty good contender. So like we've radically changed the atmosphere in terms of uh, releasing greenhouse gases, and so then that has created a long-term warming trend. Mm -hmm. But again, cyanobacteria with oxygen in the atmosphere, or if you look at trees and them pumping oxygen sure. and changing things. Okay, so all humans just, we all just fall down right now and we all just die. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna climb into the ruins of our civilization and look through all of our stuff 
You and know. then however many millions of years in the future will have museums dedicated to our civilization. I don't think museums is a qualifier for dominant species. But you see what I'm saying? You're talking about Is Planet of the Apes going to happen? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's basically the gist I'm getting. I'm not asking if specifically apes are going to rise up and take our place mm -hmm. as the dominant life form. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking... If apes are going <laughs> to like, rise and take our place as the dominant yeah, life form? but like, do you think ants would learn to walk on two legs and uh, communicate in different ways? And My answer what was going to be ants, by the way. Uh, hands down. Think about how many there are and the fact that they affect, I mean, every single piece of the terrestrial biome that they touch. I mean, a third of grass on Earth will be like manipulated and, and processed in some way by insects. And that's just insects, right? Think about invertebrates are like 95% of life on Earth. Argentine ants, those super colonies. Yeah, I love super colonies. I know. Tell me about some super colonies. I mean, that is absolutely remarkable and they're leaving I mean if you think like ant hills and the way that they're breaking things down and communication like being able to do chemical trails doing all kinds of things like how is that not dominant so I guess I'm trying to point out that dominance is different than super success right like just just totally kicking all right ass. so let's take the word dominance and success out of here yeah I'm asking if there is gonna be an animal that does what humans do that is a different question and a fair one so I think that because so many either random chance of like random changes from mutation or, you know, selected changes because of environmental pressure, so much had to happen to get us to right here that to say that it could just happen again in the same way is is it seems almost impossible, right? Whereas different selective pressure can lead to amazing different traits and, mm -hmm. and things and, and adaptations, but it doesn't have to look like humans. I mean, for all we know, like this was just, dear God, a total chance mixed with selection that got to this whole standing on two legs and doing the brain thing, right? And by brain thing, I, I, I mean- No, I know what you mean. Yeah, but I know, it, it felt, it felt a, uh, Pretty broad. <laughs> oh, I, the brain thing. For right. once, I, you know, you put it in the simplest terms and it's like, click. Oh yeah, the brain thing. I'm here for you. Thanks. Yeah, so I think it'd be unfair to say, what's the next human? Because there isn't the next human. Think about the mass extinctions throughout Earth's history. It wasn't that after mass extinction, a species rose up to be exactly in that same place or occupying the same kind of function or even features as the things before it. No, it just keeps moving forward as chance and selection. Evolution is just it just continuing. So like you never saw after a mass extinction, like, oh, and we got everything back and it looks just the same, right? Like it's amazing that we're here, but it was because things that died off before us were probably super different. And so when I think about dominance, I think about, you know, you could think about numbers, you could think of impact, like how much are, is the world or like the earth itself being impacted and that's why I mentioned something like trees or cyanobacteria but I don't know that we get this again right like this form or this working piece and with cities you mentioned building cities life on earth builds habitat all the time and when I think about like let's say all the humans are gone right now dude raccoons are gonna have a field day can you imagine all the buildings and things I mean it just becomes infrastructure yeah there's not trash anymore for them to dig through but it's still structure like things will live in our structures absolutely do you think it would be manipulators environmental manipulators that would because there's so much left behind mm -hmm. when humans pass off right. there's so much left behind that maybe there would be an evolutionary advantage to the creatures that could figure out how to use them the fastest the creature that realizes that hey this is a bicycle the, these are wheels. Look at these wheel things that move, you know, and it's the things that can manipulate. So maybe raccoons yeah. could figure it out. That'd be cool. Like basically urban exploiters. Yeah. Which, which yes, you could Ooh. argue, you could argue that some of that is availability of food. So all the humans are gone. You don't get the trash and the, and the food and, and that kind of stuff, but you do still have these incredible structures, right? We call them buildings, but it's basically just habitat. And, mm -hmm. and then at a certain point, those that are thriving within that system potentially just have kind of a free ride 
almost like you are you don't have to pay rent and the house is just built for you and then you go for oh, it. Oh, so it's possible that they'll stop evolving simply because they they don't have to anymore? Evolution doesn't stop. You don't stop evolving, but but, but when you are really well suited for an environment, you will not necessarily You become change a specialist. Much. You become um, a specialist. You could, though. Urban exploiters are more generalist, right? They do well in human-created habitats, and raccoons will do fine anywhere, basically, right? Gotta love trash pandas. It's true. So I think that because, you mentioned, because we have altered the landscape so much, it makes sense that the next successful rise of things would be something that could use all that stuff we built and erected all over the landscape. Like, right. So, I mean, that's one thought, right? Mm. But, you know, there's, there's also the, the, how, the sheer number. There's also the sheer number. Seven, seven billion people, seven plus billion people, it's not that amazing. Like, but considering, there's trillions But of considering other that only 50 years ago we were half that number, that's impressive. But it's not, though. Think about how long. We have to wait, like, well, quite a long time before we can even reproduce. You, you cannot compare that to, like, bacteria or other invertebrates. So basically what you're telling me is that I have permission to no. write a comic no. book Whatever you say where next. all no. urban exploiters no. live in a post-apocalyptic earth. Nothing but like urban exploiters have taken over. So we're talking raccoons, mm -hmm. North American possums. Deer, white-tailed deer rock that. Sure, white-tailed deer, uh, rats, mm -hmm. squirrels, mm -hmm. all these fun things. And they're all walking around, and they've got like rocket launchers, and it's like Mad Max. This is why gun safes exist, so that the squirrels cannot get access to your weaponry after the apocalypse. Just saying. I'm just saying. Safety is sexy. Basically, there's a lot of ways you can define dominance. And when you think about each of the different ways, you might come up with a species that potentially is going to kind of take the lead. But at the same time, you know there's an option where a species doesn't necessarily take the lead and everything is just kind of living in its own place. So honestly, who knows? I suppose if you were to look back however many millions and millions of years and look at, you know, those early, early mammals and, you know, a dinosaur were to say, hey, you know, hypothetically speaking, if a meteor came and we just like all died, which one of these organisms do you think would take our place? You know, they're thinking in too narrow a scope yeah. to really guess that it would have been the mammals. And honestly, you could go back to each one of those mass extinction events and probably get that guess wrong if you were at the, the mm -hmm. time of it. Because life on Earth is, is amazing and complex and, and random at times, and that's just a very, very cool thing. Life finds a way. You forgot, ba -da 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 -da. You forgot the uh. Life finds a way. Uh. No. Uh. Thank you very much. This has been an episode of From A to B. We're super stoked that, why don't you do this? Why are you doing the outro? I thought it'd be fun. Thank you for joining us for this extinctions themed From A to B episode. I uh, quite enjoyed myself in a similar way to the way that life uh, finds a way. In a, uh, similar way than uh, life uh, finds a way. No one can really be sure of what Earth's biodiversity will look like after humans have gone. But while we're still around, we may as well learn about the ways that life on Earth has come and gone over billions of years of living history. Thanks so much for watching, and if you'd like to keep going on Life on Earth adventures with us here on Nature League, make sure to go to youtube.com slash Nature League, subscribe, and share. Hey guys, we now have a Nature League pin on DFTBA.com. Click on the link in the description below to get yours.